Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. All right, how does that apply to us? Well, one well-executed set with good technique, good control, good form, good stability is more effective than 10 poorly executed sets. Exercises are techniques. It's not just about getting sore. It's not just about sweating and getting tired. It's about perfecting the technique so that that technique delivers the results that it could deliver. So make those exercises perfect. It'll give you the best results. Isn't this what, um, kick those results? <laughs> Whoa. Well, hold on. You wanted to hold do on. that so You just want to show his shoes off. Did you see that? So bad. Like, <laughs> These are my fast are those, shoes. Are those, yeah, are those your uh, racing I have another color yeah. fast shoe. Just uh, right. no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will fucking Are those the same ones guys. I made fun of last time, but a different color? Yeah. yeah. They are, dude. They are, I, he's, he's I do like white in. better, though. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, yeah. You like right. them better? This is like you're wearing we socks. Gotta, we got to stick fair. to the fit tip here okay. before Anyways, everybody drops off. Easy, easy. Yeah. So uh, isn't that what Arnold uh, was speaking to when he... What was the thing he said? He said, I can go one one set's more effective than 20 of your, yeah. your sets. Yeah. yeah and and now, that's the same concept totally. of what he's, uh, to what he's alluding to. Look at, if you look at... Now, people uh, in high-level sports, coaches who coach athletes understand this. Like, you'll never take an athlete and just have them drill a movement that they don't know how to do well just until they get tired. It doesn't make any sense. You want them to perfect the technique because there's a way to throw a free throw. There's a way to pitch a baseball. There's a way to swing a bat. And the technique matters a lot. It matters a lot in how you perform. Well, squats, deadlifts, bench presses, overhead presses, rows, curls, doesn't matter. There's a technique to it that is optimal. And the optimal technique, when it's performed in that way, produces the best results. And yeah. that's important because oftentimes people go to the gym and they think, I'm going to go hammer my shoulders. They don't think to themselves, I'm going to perfect the art of overhead pressing. And that's a huge mess. Yeah, this just kind of stems back to our, our whole philosophy of treating exercises more as a skill. Like this is skill mastery. And when you approach it more of a skill mastery position, you, you don't need a huge toolbox to get the job done. You only need a few that you can just, you know, you, you can base the rest of it off of these yes. once you really learn um, how, to, how to do something at that high of a level. But once you have that ability, man, it, it opens up so much more potential. It's really unfortunate that it, this is, this is so important, but we don't, we don't have enough or the right research to support this all the way. So because there's so many factors that getting good at the technique that the, the carry over from that, that you couldn't just do a simple control. Like you could do, I'm sure there's a study we can find where you do, you know, uh, 10 people who are concentrating and, and maybe prime their body. And then they focus on the lift really good. And we measure like how much muscle activation yeah. and muscle they build versus, but, and then you have another group of 10 who you know, just are, are aloof and they're not paying attention and they don't prime and whatever they're distracted or they have poor technique. And then we could measure those two groups. But the problem with that is that there's more things that happen to that group that are working because that it's compounding, right? So you, if you practice and you get really good at the technique, well, then that also is going to make you better connect to those muscles. If you're better connected to those muscles, you're also going to be able to potentially get to carry more load and more weight. If you carry more load and more weight, you're potentially going to yeah. build more muscle. And so the the benefits of it are, are much greater than just a, a simple controlled study of, oh, what's the difference between somebody who really can focus on an exercise versus somebody who kind of well, just aloofly does how it. How quickly can you recruit the potential uh, amount of force and you know, it's like, it, again, like, it, like how long does it take you to get into that kind of like flow, like all of these other factors that kind of go into that. Yeah. Well, okay. So the issue with the studies is, I mean, they have studies that they'll have highlight some, some they'll of have, it. Highlight some well, of it. Well, they'll have some, well, they'll, they'll say, okay, uh, this group over here, concentrate on the chest during the bench press. And this group over here, just bench press. And they'll find better activation in the people that concentrate. Now to what you're saying, the problem with that is whenever they conduct a study with exercises, uh, I'm going to assume this, but this is probably true that the people conducting the study, know good technique and they're watching the people exercise. So they're not like doing like you guys have bad form. You guys have good form now as trainers and people who've managed gyms and worked with people for a long time. We know this because we see it. Like here's what happens when you make, when you treat exercise, like a skill and a technique versus just a way to get tired and tired and sore. Number one, your form is always going to be better. Uh, number two, you're going to train appropriately, meaning you're not just going to keep going once your form breaks down because you're prioritizing form. So injury risk goes down. Number three, the intensity becomes more appropriate. Your form and technique should dictate the intensity. 
not how hard you could push yourself. Now, a lot of people listening are like, what do you mean? Like, I'm advanced. I can push my... Well, yeah, the better you get, the longer you can maintain technique and form under fatigue. You get a beginner and rep one, they're having challenge with the form and technique. You get someone who's been doing a squat for 10 years and they could go to failure mm -hmm. and have pretty good technique the entire time. But the exercises exist. There is a technique of each exercise that exists for a reason. Number one, biomechanically, they've been practiced for you know 100 years by thousands or millions of people. So we know that biomechanically, this is the most uh, this is the safest way to perform this exercise. This is how we've trained athletes. Number two, that this is the way that people can lift the most load. Powerlifters figure this out. Powerlifters, for example, you, your your goal is obviously to lift more weight than your competitors. And they figured out the best technique to allow them to lift the most load. Well, simultaneously, that's also the safest technique. The safest technique will allow you to lift the most load. The ones that are less safe won't allow you to do so. Um, bodybuilders figure this out with muscle connection and how to feel muscles contract and whatever. But so many people go to the gym and they think that exercises are just, it's just a means to an end. Like, oh, I'm just going to go in and today's legs, so I'm just going to get yeah. my legs really. It has to just cover the body parts. Yeah, I'm just going to get really sore. Or I'm just going to get really tired. And um, that's not that's not how you maximize your results. That's how you train inappropriately. That's how you increase your risk of injury. That's how you get terrible results. If instead you went to the gym and picked four exercises for your workout, let's say, and you went in and said, I'm going to make those, I'm going to really get good at squatting. I'm going to get really good at bench pressing and rowing and overhead pressing, for example. I'm going to perfect the skill. I'm going to perfect the technique and the range of motion and the connection. And I'm going to add load but I'm not going to surpass what my technique, what I, how I can manage my technique. If you do it that way, you will progressively see yourself stronger. You will progressively continue to see results without injury. And then what happens is as you get better at those exercises, they pay you back more and more. Somebody who's advanced can get more out of a squat than someone who's only done it, you know, five times. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the technique. And yes, there's other, there's other things that, you know, people are going to say, well, what about the central nervous system connection and the muscle recruitment pattern. That's what perfecting a technique is, right? Like you learn how to throw a baseball. You have to teach your body how to recruit muscle muscles in the right way, how to generate speed and stability, how to, you know, uh, accurately throw and aim. Well, that's what's happening with these exercises. That's part of the process. And if you ignore that and go to the gym and just try to get sore or tired, yeah, you're burning calories, but boy, you're missing like 90% of the results you can get because you're just not, you're not considering these as skills. They're just no. a way to get things, you know. I mean, I also tired. think this is why a lot of people are uh, spin their wheels and they don't see totally. results as fast as some other people too. Is some people are just really good at that. Some people, yeah. I mean, we've all trained these clients, right? Like how many, how many times can you recall having in the same day, right? Client A, I, I teach them this exercise and I can literally cue them a few things. Oh, hips back, chest up, shoulders back, yeah. whatever. And then there's boom, boom, boom. They get into position. And it's like, and then, and then another person where I'm just like, we got to spend the whole hour on like, well, we don't hold, wait, pull these back. And then yeah. you pull that back. Then this slides out. And it's like, yeah. and they just can't, they're not good. They're not connected. Well, of course that person and that person could be dieting just right, showing up to the gym just as many times as the other person but they don't quite see the results that the other person said because they're not getting the most not out yet. of every movement no. yet. And so it's also uh, for, for people that are listening to, to be patient <coughs> and to, to again, to, to, if you're, if you're listening to this and you, you might be one of those people that like, man, there's a lot of value in just going to the gym and practicing these movements and perfecting what are the, the skill. Well, what are the also, best? Yeah. Also too, like, and I've heard Katrina bring this up, like Courtney brings this up to me all the time when you're kind of like off of your training for, let's say a month or, or so. And it's like, we really need to get back in shape. And like, this is kind of an agreement amongst like me and Courtney. And then it's like, you know, I start to get into it. I'm very limited in what I'm doing, but very like deliberate and intentional. And, you know, and then she's kind of just trying to take a lot on. She's in there for a long period of, during the day. And then, you know, eventually the next week's really starting seeing results. I'm seeing changes already happen. gets really frustrated, tries to compare herself to me. But again, the, the muscle maturity, the element there is definitely a factor because you know, I know what to do. And you know the value of the technique. Look, what do the best uh, athletic coaches say? Fundamentals. Practice the fundamentals, right? Practice the, the basics. But what Bruce Lee was saying, here's the deal. Anybody who's in the fight sports will tell you this, that a boxer with three years of experience uh, will probably beat the crap at a 99% of most martial art, you know, striking uh, black belts. Okay. Why? 
and, and look at it this way. Boxer has like four moves, right? It was a jab, straight, you know, hook, uppercut, right? Martial arts has like 50,000 different techniques and moves. Well, how's, why is the boxer so effective? Well, first off, they train in, in a real fight and they also perfect four moves so well that they know how to execute them perfectly at any, you know, whenever they want to, at the right timing and all that kind of stuff. That's why Bruce Lee said what he said. Mm -hmm. It's like the guy who practices one kick 10,000 times, he has one move, yeah. but he'll know when to hit it and how to, and how to throw it and you're in trouble. The guy that practiced you know, 10,000 moves one time knows none of them. Well, this is true for exercise as well. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. back to Justin's shoes. Those are, <laughs> <laughs> That's a commercial Thank you for, break from them. So yeah. I mean, obviously you liked them enough to buy another pair. You know, I it, didn't discourage you from I, that, obviously. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> No, nah, see, that's, that's me. I'm an asshole. Yeah, you guys make fun of me. All I just, that's just, hey, that is just his personality. Make fun of us. Like, Fuck this guy. I'm going to order two pairs. Yeah, he, yeah, he did. Like, exactly. I'm going to get myself a white exactly pair, too. Fuck yeah. this guy. Yeah, I'm going to wear him and flaunt yeah. him in their face. I feel like you could run up the wall. Say with something. That. I feel like if you ran straight and then, like, you just go up the wall. Yeah. You know what I mean? Actually, I bought these because, like, uh, when uh, we were shooting and I was doing uh, some footage for exercises and stuff, I was like, I'm kind of funny like that. Like, I'm, I'm not real into like the fashion. I mean, I am very much have a style and have a thing, but like, it's a little bit extra if like, if it's, I have to be like, the attention's like only on me. And so mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna have a uniform. I'm gonna have <laughs> hats made, you know, yeah. like all this bullshit, you know, that goes with it. <laughs> and that's just how I am. But yeah, this was part of that kind of thought process. It's uh -oh. like, I gotta, you know, have some, uh, this is your new uniform. I can't do the chucks, I guess. Yeah, it's my <laughs> if 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 it's athletically kind of driven and, and how many do you guys own a lot? Of, well, I know you do, Adam. I'm not gonna ask you this question, but do you own like shoes that you bought once and you like because you had an idea and you didn't wear them again? Yeah, oh, you do. I yeah. do. It, it, it was like, and it's usually because I'm like, I just I don't know what I'm gonna wear these with. Yeah, like, what, what was I thinking? I did that the other day. I don't know what happened to me. That's not like you. No, bro, not at all. I don't know what happened to me, but I was like, you know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll like start practicing running a little bit, you know, what? just to practice. You did not have this thought. <laughs> I swear to God, I did. I swear to God, I did. I don't know what happened. So I'm like, I'm gonna practice it a little bit. You know, drugs. I haven't like <laughs> trained like that in a long time. You saw so those hookah shoes or so something. So I should get yeah. So I should get something with a lot of like safeties. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of guardrails. So I got a put, I got this parachute. I swear to God, it looks like. I mean, did you get some hookah? Looks shoes? like it's made out of marshmallows. What kind of shoes did you get? I don't even know what the brand is. It looks. I should have Jessica send a picture. It looks like marshmallows on oh them. And the, I wore, that's, what those, that's what those hookah shoes. I wore like. them once, and I like, and, and I didn't even run them. I just put them on and walked around. No, with you did it. I did, I did not. Know you it was did a that. total. Impulse I feel thing. like I feel like oh, you and you Doug that. probably are notorious for almost buying something then talking yourself out of buying it. Yeah. I feel like you guys both do that a lot. Yeah. I feel like you look at stuff uh, and then you then you decide and then maybe not. not. To, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do that. Doug's, do you not think you do that, Doug? You don't do that. Maybe sometimes. Oh yeah? yeah, yeah. You feel like if you if you're committed, if I'm on the edge, if you're already shopping, you're almost committed then to buy. If it's something I really want, yeah. No, I know you do that. I know if I you, do evaluate, is this something I'm going to use? Not yeah. going to use? Do you uh, think the last time it happened? You know, speaking of shoes, I have like six pairs of shoes I've worn maybe once or never at all. Oh wow! I ordered them online. They looked. I thought they looked good. And then you put them on. And I just, yeah, they're yeah. just not me. They're not Shoes good. are hard to buy online. Yeah, Unless you're buying like tough. a, a like brand, you know a style you like you've that. already worn and it's just like a different colorway. Getting like a, like a, a something you've never wore online is really See, tough. Hats are, are, yeah. Same thing. Hats with that. Yeah, I feel too. the same way too. Really? Certain, yeah, because they fit. Yeah, because sometimes the fit of a hat, the fit of a shoe. I'm like, ah. like I can't wear this now. All hats do that to me. I hate that. When I put on a hat, it's like this big. <laughs> you know, you know, bucket. Yeah, it looks too much. Yeah, it's, that's so weird. Yeah, some people just don't have a good hat head. I mean, it's true. Like, no, I know, don't. Like, that's just the off. Because you got a bird like, face, that's why. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> why is this a dick? Why are you such a dick? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, go turn down the thermostat. Or turn it up yeah. real quick. Oh, Fuck with that up. Oh, man. Oh, don't start. I won't bring that up. Don't start with I won't bring, Hey, okay. listen. Oh, I can see that. You are. Motherfucker. You are trying it again. Oh, bro. Oh. Are, it's nice. yeah, I'm there not touching that cool thing anymore. Right there is I'm something. Done. There is definitely a childhood thing with that thermostat with you. Definitely. It's, no. It's, oh, I, yes, there no, is, dude. It's not, it's not so That thing is off by two degrees. We We just. We just spent a, a gang of money on making this place perfectly climate, like right? the perfect climate here. And since we've bought it, we don't run it. And it's yeah, just, what the fuck? What we was do it? run it though. What was it? We do run it. No, no we don't. Emissions. We run it like for a minute and then we Listen, shut it off. It want, makes no sense to me. We don't want carbon emissions. Yeah. That's what 
I think it, what, I think what the where we didn't think what we didn't think about was the guy who likes it tropical in here. I don't touch it. Don't okay. put it on me. So listen, the guy who likes it tropical yeah. is right underneath the vent. Yeah. So the the likelihood that you're going to get cold before hey, Justin. What if I get a space heater? Hey, hey he's listen. whispering. When we go to the bathroom, he's whispering. I think he is. I Stop, told, turn yeah. it down. Turn it off. Doug and I have like a side text thread. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, it's, it's a, it wouldn't surprise me. You know, Doug's been taking care of you since day one. Oh, the best lighting, on. the best cameras. <laughs> now we get an AC unit. Got to have it shut off because Sal's cold. Oh my gosh. So what's going oh on in here? Oh my gosh. All right. Crazy, Doug, man. Doug, make sure you edit that out. Today's workout program giveaway is MAPS 40 plus. This is for the 40 and over crowd. Now, this is not a regressed workout program like a lot of 40 plus workout programs. This is a hardcore workout program, builds muscle, burns body fat. It's just programmed with the concerns of people who've been working out for a little while. So some of the exercises are different. The tempos can be different. The program's a little different. We also included um, get lifestyle guidelines. We have dietary guidelines, supplement guidelines. Anyway, I'm going to give one of those away for free to one of you right now. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you do all those things, then you enter to win the brand new program for yourself for free. Now, everybody else, if you want to get signed up, if you don't want to wait to see if you won or whatever, you want to get signed up because it's a brand new launch, it's on sale. So you can click on the link at the bottom of the description below. You'll get $80 off, plus you'll get two free eBooks because of this brand new launch that is ending on the 24th. So if you're interested, you got to act now. All right, back to the show. Uh, no, listen, hey, we just talked about impulsive stuff, uh, impulsive buys and stuff. Did, okay, Remember we had Dr. Seeds on and we, he was talking, he's obviously, he, he is a peptide expert. He's a doctor, one of the lead researchers. Mm -hmm. This guy's been talking about peptides for a long time. He knows his stuff. And then we got to the, the, the topic of semaglutide. Yes. Okay. Semaglutide, um, brand name, Ozempic or Wegovy. Okay. <coughs> this is the peptide that is probably what is bringing the FDA down on other peptides because peptides have been available. You can get them at compound pharmacies, a doctor can prescribe them incredible benefits. They're not drugs. They're different. These are things that we've actually already isolated in the body that exist that basically signal the cells to take action. And because they exist naturally in the body, they have totally different safety profiles and all that. So it's like incredible. But the problem with peptides is you can make any compound pharmacy at, at the moment can make them. So you can't patent them. Okay. But big pharma's kind of not done anything about it. Like whatever you got peptides over here. We'll do our drugs over there. Yeah. All of a sudden, some glutide comes out. You and making it, money. It is <clears throat> literally, uh, when it comes to weight loss interventions, okay, it's the most effective one that's ever, so far, that we've ever seen. Like, you, people lose 15, 20% of the body weight when they take it. And so, all of a sudden, FDA cracking down, all that stuff. But we had Dr. Seed on, and he said doctors that have been working with some glutide have noticed that people, not only do they eat less, but they'll also... Stop drinking alcohol, stop, stop smoking, smoking cigarettes, cigarettes stop habits. biting their nails, yeah. Yeah. like all these like weird habits. And they've all been observing this, which is really crazy. Guess what just came out? A study, a study on it. And it showed that not only did it reduce people, obviously their caloric intake, which is what people use it for, for the most part, but a dramatic decrease in the use of alcohol and tobacco. Yeah, wow. that's wild. So it's not, here's what's crazy about this is it's seen, this is the theory, right? It seems to act, it's not suppressing your appetite in traditional ways where you just don't feel hungry. It's acting on the part of the brain that makes you want to medicate yourself with some kind of impulsive behavior. Yeah. And a lot of overeating mm -hmm. is that. A lot of people who deal with weight issues and food issues, it's not real hunger. We know this, right? Yeah. It's it's more of this kind of impulsive coping. Like I need something. Correct. At this point. It's yeah. like the self medicating. Dude, so if it, it works on all that other is stuff, so screwed. They, they now they piss off the food industry, the tobacco, <laughs> the tobacco <laughs> big industry, coming, big, big, big alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, they're fucked. Oh, Wait man. for all the negative article publicity that's coming around. Boy, heaven forbid one person dies. If someone dies or something crazy happens, oh, it's gonna be we're gonna ban uh, it. Yeah, it's either that or shit either that or because of its potential blockbuster money, you know, just the money that it can make. Because this is what's already happened. The FDA did this earlier. Yeah, the money can make for one industry, but it screws the other. You're five. right. I know. That's I know. one against five. And now. what's what's crazy is it's a GLP one agonist. There's other peptides that are more effective now that are coming out than semaglutide. But I mean, this is crazy. So like, imagine this could potentially be a peptide that people could use for. <clears throat> undesirable impulsive behaviors 
So maybe not just weight loss. Maybe that's a side effect. Like, man, I do yeah, this I thing. I wonder if like gambling yeah. and I wonder if, yeah, some of these other things, like you're just uh, a klepto or you but, know, whatever. By the way, the FDA exists for two reasons. So I'm going to be controversial, uh, but true. Okay. Prove me wrong. One, protect the consumer. Two, protect uh, big pharma. They, and they do this by creating barriers for, of competition. Um, during COVID, there's a peptide called thymosin alpha. Okay. So this, the thymus, your, your thymus produces this peptide so and it helps produce booster, right? more. Yeah. So like white blood cells helps mature them, whatever. And all, and when COVID was hitting, there was all this data and studies on doctors using thymus and alpha and saying, Oh crap, like people with COVID, less of them are getting like severe COVID issues. There's less lung damage. FDA clamped down on that peptide and made it almost impossible to get all of a sudden. Now you can get it now, but during that period of time, they clamped down. Why would they do that? Yeah. It's so crazy. And now they're doing the same thing. Now they're doing that with all peptides. They're trying to, and it's because of the GLP-1 agonist. Like the, yeah, the, they're looking at one of the so biggest popular right now. potential blockbuster, you know, interventions. I mean, if it turns out as good as it sounds, um, I, don't, I can't think of another intervention that would make more money. I well, mean, you know, in, in obesity and impulsive behaviors. Well, huh? Like this yeah, is crazy. No, that's going to be wild. Crazy. wild. Speaking of peptides, I'm so right now. Doctor Khan has got me on the GHK, which is a copper peptide. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what? it's not a it's not a copper peptide. What, um, okay, what is it? So it accelerates regeneration of skin collagen. collagen. Oh yeah. Um, also, think? also regrows hair. Um, and so people will use it for wound healing psoriasis which uh, is what you're dealing so with that's why so yes. it's to heal the, the scab and everything it's like also it's also one of the peptides that's in in Terra's uh folatin the the for hair loss oh yeah the one that i've been using oh interesting yes so number one it, it's definitely work is it the one is it one of the main ingredients yes oh, okay it is it's definitely it's definitely uh working but it's also by the way that it operates with copper i gotta i gotta uh, talk to dr seeds about this or or jay campbell I know copper, slight copper deficiency can cause you to lose hair pigment. So, and my copper was a little low. Mm -hmm. Since I've started using the GHK, um, you know, the, the folatin that's got that and some other stuff, my hair's also gotten darker. Oh, interesting. That's what, that's what Vicky was saying when she was Oh, I hair. wonder. That's something I'll, I, need I to mean, obviously, with that. I'm not using it for you, that. You told me my hair has gotten darker even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, you it's know, gotta I, be that. I or, didn't even think about paying attention. So I'll like, pay attention to that now because I know that I'm taking that consistently if I notice like my gray hairs start yeah. to lighten up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Justin could put on his eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off, dude. I've noticed those too, man. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's happening, dude. Like, right? It's like a slow, like, I will look at the mirror. I'm like, what? You're good till they go white. You're fucked when they go white, though. Yeah, he's hairy, bro. He's got, here, he, he hasn't lost a single hair. He's going to have a full. Yeah. It's all there, he has bro. Great hair, yeah. just, it's great. You know, it's, oh, it's just like, it's definitely this. I don't it's know why you wear hats all the time. Since I'm like, I don't know. I you know how my how much how my makes me angry that he wears hats all the time. I know. I know you know, all my teachers were mad too, and they were all their whole threat was like they're trying to tell me I'm going to go bald because I wear hats so yeah, much. Maybe, again, this is a big f you to everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> tell me I'm going to go bald. Well, Take that, Miss Robinson. Every day. <laughs> what? That was a myth, huh? That wearing hats made you go bald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's totally false. I mean, yep. is it though? If okay, if you do, you believe that the sun would benefit the scalp. I don't think the sun touches your scalp that much with your, when your hair is... Okay, your uh, hair follicles? You don't think you, the sun benefits that at all? I mean, yeah, but you get it in the rest of your body. I mean, I mean, I can see where so, you're going. I so, see where you're going with so, that. So uh, you got to think that it's not ideal. I think that's where it got it got murky, right? We took a we took a leap there where it's yeah. like, it's probably not the best thing for you if you're going bald to wear a yeah, hat. Maybe. Do you I mean, don't think wearing a hat makes you go bald. Uh, I, I bet you that... Well, you know what's weird about that is... Yeah. Uh, where I talked about this, I think, before. Uh, wearing sunglasses reduces your body's ability to yeah. adapt to uv rays you're more likely to sunburn mm -hmm. if you wear sunglasses because the eyes get some of the signal that the sun is out and it's hot uh, and the brain processes it and so it, it actually the, the brain gets a little confused doesn't produce as much melanin oh uh, that's that's fascinating well, yeah isn't that weird that is just weird. wearing sunglasses what are you so. gonna say doug i was just gonna say i think the argument for the hat is because of circulation because uh, that's that tight the other thing yeah right? So you're not you're not getting as much circulation. Yeah, you you're not getting tight. sun. That probably has. Like, I would. No, what about the hairy palms thing? Is that? Is that 
<laughs> it's a different. It's a total different. Oh, okay. that's, a, that's a different thing. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. my bad. Totally big feet. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. It's, they just went a whole other direction. I know. Yeah. I so know. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't totally disagree with the the hat thing. You know, I, I'm sure that it can't possibly help the situation. No. And you would think that yeah. better circulation, more sun. Did you go through a phase of wearing the, the uh, what's that hat called? The Peaky Blinder looking hat. I what wore every style. Like hat. the bowler. Or I wore every. At one point, at, at one point, I've wore every style. Did hat. you wear the every douche, style? You wear the douchey hat. Every uh, whatever. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There was so a just, time. You know what I mean? Like that. When I was a lady, kid, you know, I had a uh, I had a bigger hey. rotation of hats than I had shoes. Right. So, oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was more of a hat junkie in in high school than I was even a, I was always a sneakerhead, but I, I couldn't afford to have a lot of sneakers. Mm. But I did have a lot of hats. Oh yeah. I had a with the Baker Boy is that it's called. So yeah, I did all. I did it all. Wow. Boy. You know, I, you know, but boy, we're, one of the things that we all kind of have in common, especially I know, I know Justin and I like that we were talking about his shoes and teasing him. Like, I, I, I like, I relished in that. I liked being somebody who didn't do what everybody else did. And if you made fun of me, I doubled down on it. Like, yeah. So if I wore a hat like that and you're like, oh, that's douchey, I'm like, oh, I'm wearing it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I never let, like I was, I was as, uh, you know, skinny and crooked teeth and poor and all the yeah. things that yeah. I should be insecure about. I don't know. I reframed it as a kid, and it was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm That's a great. I don't want to claim it, but I'm pretty sure I was responsible for the popularity of the work shirt. You know, yeah, yeah. that was a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, like the, go the mechanic the, shirt or whatever yeah, like that with your name on it. I kept getting it. hand-me-downs and all this, and literally, we went to this place called the Bargain Barn. I think I've told you this. You <laughs> Wait, buy, that's a real place. Yeah, you buy just like. Uh, people's trash in bulk, yeah. you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were poor at some point, and like I'm just wearing the shirt, and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of cool." It was like a, a, a refrigerator repairman shirt. You know? <laughs> no this is like Bob, and I just started wearing it at school. I was in elementary school, and then like right after that, I think it was like junior high. It was like this trend, you know. Everybody's wearing like work shirts. Wow, was, that you was started a, that for it sure. Was me, that was a trend. yeah. I I see pictures of myself. Uh, as a kid sometimes and I'm like man I looked way more ethnic than I thought you know because my mom would <laughs> my mom would put me in like I'd have a big like a big ass gold like cross chain right I'm a little <laughs> kid you know what I mean yeah. like a dangerous one like you wouldn't want a kid to wear this because it could hurt no that's what I yeah. would wear yeah. big ass gold chain and you know the beater or the white t-shirt or you know tucked in or whatever yeah. and I'm looking at pictures like mom what did you yeah. Why'd you dress me like that? She's like, that's the way that's the way we dressed our kids, you know? Yeah. Anyway. When you get home, yeah. you're just like, hey, yeah. mom. You remind me when we get done podcasting. I got I probably won't be able to find it right now while we're talking, but you just reminded me of something. I've I found that someone found this picture of Katrina and I. Uh from what, it actually time made ago? me well, it was when we first met. It's when we first started dating. So I'm I'm like 29, she's 30. And uh if, I tell you what, what made me feel really, I look at what, what I said was we both look super ethnic. Like she looks like <laughs> yeah, right. we both look super ethnic. And I'm like, Oh my God, we look so different. I for sure think we look better at the way we've aged for oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, that's 29, 30 years yeah. old, bro. Uh, yeah. I'll take me a four, a 42 then over yeah. 29, oh, yeah. or 30. Yeah. I'll take that. My, I'll take that as a win. My you know? teeth and fat face. Dude. Yeah. I, was, I, I, okay. I moved a lot better back then. I don't move as well yeah. as I used to move back you then. But, and then, and Katrina too. I mean, Katrina, I think is, uh, I mean, after a kid and 40 something years old, oh, she looks phenomenal. far, far more attractive phenomenal. and better than she looked even when we, when we first oh, met. That's, that's, so that's nice. I, uh, speaking of, uh, of, of women or whatever, have you guys ever heard of the strong woman? So she was a strong woman <sighs> during the bronze era of, you know, like Eugene Sandow time, right? Yeah. Katie Sandwina. Have you yes. heard of, Have you guys heard of her? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Dude. I confirm, I, I I went to like three different sources. She I'm going to pull lift her husband over her head. What? Yeah. No, 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 no. Listen, bro. You, you yeah. don't understand. Google it. This is the craziest shit I've ever, ever heard in my life. Do you guys know how she made her, how she became famous? Uh, uh, no, she, other than being she, strong. She would do, um, she would do exhibitions where she'd go up on stage and challenge any man to wrestle her <coughs> in the audience. Oh, rest oh, that's okay, awesome. any man. Yeah. And she would defeat all of them. Now, this was, like I said, this is like the early 1900s, late 1800s. Nobody could beat her. That's how she met her husband, by the way. She, he wrestled her. <laughs> she kicked the shit out of him. Then she, yeah. This is how she became famous. You know who she defeated in a strongman contest? Who? Eugene Sandow. Oh, wow. Really? You ready for this? Okay. This, this, now, what? this, remember, this was an actual contest. Yeah. People were there and people were re recording this. And I've now gone to three different sources because it sounds the lifts? it sounds like bullshit to me. Yeah. Okay. Recording this. How it, are they recording it this? It sounds like bullshit to me. 
She lifted a weight of 300 pounds over her head. No way. Sandow only was able to get it to his chest. And then she, and that's how she became famous. 300 can, can pounds over her head. Three, okay, ready for this? Her record of an overhead press, which was almost 300 pounds, 296 pounds, stood until Karen Marshall, a woman weightlifter, <clears throat> beat it in 1987. Damn. So it's legit. There she is right there. Let me see. Now, you want to guess the size of that no woman right there? No way. Oh, hold on. No way. I, hey. No, she's. She was like tall, right? Six and big. She's six one over two hundred pounds. She was an bro, Amazon. And for back big. then, they're all no. like malnourished. Bro, uh, 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 this is remember this is nineteen hundred. A woman that's six one. First of all, there's no guys that were six one. No. Okay, that's her right there, holding her husband above yeah, her head it. with I've one seen that arm. Picture, yeah. Wow. That was part of her act. How do we not bring her up before? That's I, so don't great. Yeah, I don't how did know. I don't know. You find her. Who someone said it? There's to her? no. There's this uh, this Instagram page that shows these Bronze Era yeah. like athletes. And um, she popped up, and the picture that popped up, Doug. If you scroll up a little bit, uh, back up to the right, to the right. No, no, down, down a little more. No, oh, right there to the left at the top. Sorry, she's holding three men in her arms like they're children. Scroll up at the very. It's at the very top on the very left. There I you see go. Another one down there. Look yeah. at that. There's one man in one arm, <laughs> two wow. men in the other arm, and that's a, she's posing for a picture, dude. I couldn't hold a bunch of dudes like that. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. And now this is what's crazier. What's even crazier about this? is this was before, forget steroids, they didn't even exist back then. This was before supplements. I know. Isn't that insane? It's so crazy. Mind-blowing how strong she was. But yeah, anyway, well, pretty yeah, pretty yeah, cool stuff. pretty sweet. Uh, so what's the deal with uh, White Claw now made a non-alcoholic drink? Have you yeah. heard about well, this? Well, they're getting in, the, they're getting in the, the bubbly water space, I think, right? Or it's oh, is seltzer that it water is? or whatever. Why, does anybody drink White Claw for its taste? I don't, I don't know. Is that the, what's the deal here? <laughs> yeah, I think well, that's well, exactly. I mean, I think it's, it's just stay it's, masculine. It's not just because it's got alcohol and it. it's because it tastes good and it has alcohol in you it. You like the taste of White Claw? I mean, I don't. Justin does. Justin was a White Claw guy. Do you really? I can't get enough of it. It's so they're making they're going uh, non alcoholic, so it could be like a seltzer. Yeah, what water. I what I wasn't sure was if it was a just a like a, a seltzer water or if it's actually going to be like an energy drink space like, or high, uh, electrolyte drink. Did you look it up, Doug? No, I saw I saw the article. Uh, brief, briefly skimmed it and thought that was interesting. I mean, that's like the move right now. Everybody's moving into the... Yeah. the well, the, they created an entire new It's electrolyte. Segment, it's electrolyte-infused it booze-free drinks. Just electrolytes. Yeah. So that's not... Mm. I mean... So not, is it just basically salsa water with some... I with guess... Some, so what they're saying is that they're capitalizing on the growing number of Gen Z consumers abstaining from alcohol. Is that a movement? Yeah. Is it? That Gen Z is like no alcohol? Yeah. yeah. Really? I mean, I've heard of bars that tried to open up to just do like these mocktails. So they just get really creative drinks, but they're all non-alcoholic. I mean, that's been, a, that's actually a really popular market right now. It's yeah. mocktails. Uh -huh. is, is, is coming why, up. Why is there a movement against, against alcohol for Gen Z? Do you know? I Okay. So this goes all the way back to when I shared all the stats on the iGen book that I read years ago. Like they were already, they were already predicting a lot of this stuff. And remember we kind of this big debate and mm -hmm. I said it was because that the Gen Z has so much access they listen to, to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, they have so much access to information now and data that they they can Google, is alcohol bad for me? And then they get all the crazy stuff about it where we didn't have access to this stuff. We had to go figure it out or we had to find out from a friend. or like. And if all your friends said it was awesome and it was great, you're more likely to believe your circle of friends that are partying and having fun yeah. than all the stats that show, oh, if you drink at this age and you do these things and all this, all these negative things that you can find that there's plenty of studies and, and research around, and I just don't think that we, because we didn't have that. And I just think the kids, we remember we talked about that with abstaining from sex and, yeah. and not doing stuff like that. Like Maybe they're drugs. not going out and meeting with each other, so they're not doing anything. I mean, you could add that into yeah. their, that too, yeah. right? It's probably, I doubt it's one thing, right? It's yeah. probably multiple things. You have, you have less. Uh, Double-edged sword, right? Social gathering. Yeah, like double-edged sword because they're more, they're more anxious and depressed and less social, but they're also having less unprotected sex and doing less drugs. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. That's one's better. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Can we do one like the better of each? You know, what does that say right there? Gen Z drinks on average twenty percent less than millennials, who also drink less than the previous generation. That's a lot. That's Mainly a lot. because of an increased awareness of the dangers ha. and effects of alcohol. Ah, that's a that, yeah, but God, that brought us exactly what I just said. I, you're right, but okay, hold on. An overwhelming eighty six percent of Gen Z consumers believe that their mental health is as significant as their physical health. Oh, you know what? This That's, might be a side effect of the fact that more of them are anxious and depressed. They're just more aware of, oh shit, 
Although I mean, you would think the opposite, right? I just think anxiety that and depression will make you drink more. I just think that they have this this access to information. I mean, I, I mean, come on, you're a nerd. I know you would have done this if you had Google <laughs> back in your high school day, and your buddies are all pressuring nerd. you to go do some drugs, yeah. or go pressure you to do something like that. You would Google. Yeah, I know you. Who me? Yes. Yeah. You totally would. Yeah. You would be like, what are the side effects of yeah. of Molly, and what yeah. what yeah, are yeah, some yeah. of the adverse effects? What happens if I take this many milligrams? So you back would do then that. it'd be, I would encyclopedia, and yeah. I would be like, hey, let's go try this. We'll yeah. figure this out. If it's not good, we'll find out tonight. You know, John what I'm saying? said he did it. And he didn't. Die. Yeah, he's alive. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I'll be fine. Like yeah. that. I mean, that's kind of. I believe that's how we we approached a lot of things. Oh, when we were kids, you just asked the dude, the stoner. Yeah. yeah. What's the effect of this? Oh, it's you know. I mean, yeah, all freedom. all risky behavior is on the on the, okay, the decline. I mean, that's what I remember when I read that book. That's what the, all the stats are pointing in that direction. That like all risky behavior in the generate last millennial generation now Gen Z. It's just. It's declining, but they're also less. There's also some negative. So it's got. They're, they've got to be tied together. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what causes well, your uh, point you're making yeah. with the lack of connectivity and socializing and getting to be because this is the age that, is what what results in twenty plus percent. Yeah, because right? I mean, this is what, the age that you take those risks, right? You experiment, yeah. you do those things. Yeah. But if you're going out less, you're meeting less with people, you're at home more. You're going to do less of that. You're going to take take. You're going to embark on less of those behaviors. But then the other side of that is. You know, social, you know what? You know what question I had? Maybe a parent that has high school kids can can answer this for me, or somebody who's in high school who actually listens to this. How many kids break the the high school or the driving license law now? I feel like I would have broke that all the time. So they, you know, they can't have anybody that's under the age of twenty five in the car. Can you imagine being in high school, getting your license, and and you can't drive? And you can't drive with your friends. Yeah. It would be lame. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's broken all the time. All the time. Yeah. It is. Okay. Okay. I was gonna say, I was wondering like how strict they're they're upholding that yeah. that law. That's a, that's a smart law, though, if you think about it, because based uh, on the statistics, yeah. Well, yeah, when I drew distractions. Oh my god. Like the, the well, worst driving I did was well, when I had my friends. Well, the car. I, I remember seeing this one time. The the difference, uh the the increase of risk. On a 16 year old driver versus an 18, 21, 20, it's expon it's yeah, exponentially yeah, yeah. less. It's right? one of the leading causes of death, yeah. especially for males. Uh, young males behind the wheel, it's very dangerous. Literally, super risky to have a young man drive. And then you add their friends in there, forget it. It's one of the worst things they could do. Yeah, yeah. It's scary when my when my son started driving. Like, uh, it was the most afraid. Now he's a good kid, so he doesn't take a lot of risk anyway. But it was the most afraid that I've ever, you know, when you give them the keys and they go drive off, oh, you're just like, oh, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> that day's oh. going to come, dude. Bro. You got it coming ah. soon, man. I mean, you remember that. Yeah, you know I'm what that feels like, about it. Doug, with your daughter. It's just mm. the scariest. It's one of the scariest. Still things. scary. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Super. So super they do scary. break it then. Yeah. That's a, it's a, I thought so. I would assume so. I'm like, that's such a crazy rule. That would be, yeah. that was yeah. the coolest part about getting to high school and getting, I remember my buddy, the, the, our friend that was the oldest of all of us, you know what I'm saying? Like he, oh, yeah. he, went, he, was the, he got this license. We all piled it. Oh, you know yeah. Yeah. Like six people Making in a Mustang. Taco Bell you know? runs. Yeah, <laughs> dude. That was like, that was it. He was driving I was us just everywhere. Talking, you know, it's funny too. I was just Raising talking hell. Uh, to Jessica about this. She was considering doing a, a, a long road trip with her mom and the two babies. And you know, you, you, she's like, I'm going to stop a lot to let the kids move around and stuff. And I'm thinking, like, when I was a kid, we would go on these long-ass road trips, and they didn't pull over. My parents didn't really pull over to let us, like, move around. And then I'm like, oh, it's because we were moving around in the car. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't wear seatbelts. No, I mean, you, 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 yeah. I mean, look at, you ever watch your kids in the car? Yeah. Like, if you have, especially a Bro. toddler, they're strapped in, man. Like, do, yeah. do. Like, they're not moving. And so my kid gets anxious if he's in there for longer than an hour. Well, of course he, he can't do anything. When I was a kid, we were running around in the As long as my dad could see it through the rearview mirror, yeah. he let us do whatever we were. We were in the back of the pickup, dude, the camper shell. Like, yeah. It's the only thing like keeping us in there. <laughs> oh, we were sitting on each other's laps. Like That's how you'd fit more people in the car, and we you would know, drive. And speaking of kids, you guys see that stat. I think I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was Dylan or, or Jerry who shared the article on, is it 10 or 15% of teenagers say they spend uh, – more than like 15% of their time on like con or not 10 or 15% of teenagers say that they are on TikTok or YouTube co constantly. Oh, Ugh. nonstop. Wow. Yeah. Like all day, nonstop. You know what's crazy? I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it yep. firsthand. So I know it's happening. You know what's crazy like about that? All my friends or my, my kids' friends. Yeah, yeah. You know what's crazy about that is your brain thinks that's the world you live in. So your perception is completely based off, especially when you're a child. So you may think the kid may say, oh, I know I'm just watching videos, 
but your brain is looking at it and going, everybody looks like this. This is how people act. This are the, this is what people's opinions are life. Like, this is what the real world is like. So then you shape yourself around this obviously fake world. It's not only that, but then you're also, it, you're, you're also what you're trading that time for to you the, missing out. the point that Peterson made when we talked about this is that you're supposed to be going and interacting with others and practicing Dude, being out in society. I just saw a commercial. I saw this thing. Did you see it? Bring it up. One yeah. of the most powerful commercials yeah. I've ever what seen. What was it? So it's this guy, he's sitting at the, like, it looks like, like he's like at a diner. It's a diner, yeah. It's like a diner and he's sitting at a table and there's two girls sitting in front of him. Present day? No, no. no. It looks like it's like an old, like older, it's right? It's like a, yeah. yeah. And he's like sitting behind, like in, the, in a table and he's eating and then he sees the two girls and you can see like musters up the courage. Then he goes and he walks over to the girl and she's like smiling and he goes, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I'd love to ask you out on a date. And she's smiling. And then it switches. And in reality, what he's doing. Well, he was writing her number. He's on writing like her number napkin. Down. Yeah. And then the napkin turned turns into, into his phone, phone and he's swiping. Swipe right. And swipe. swipe left, and then, and then right. it shows it shows him on in his bed. By himself. And then the projected screen of it behind and just like, you know, just all alone. Like by the himself, difference. Just, just swiping. It, swiping. No. What was the commercial for? I think it was a show like 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 the dangers of like your your kids just being stuck on social media. Oh, like it was like out. a not. It was like a not, yeah. not a, uh, advertisement. No. Oh, interesting. No. You yeah, I don't remember what it was promoting. Find that. I no. want to see but that. Commercial. It was, that sounds interesting. Yeah, it was Bro, pretty it clever. Hit me. That's cool. Yeah. You know why it hit me? Because uh, we didn't date that way. None of us did, right? No. Um, think of as a man, okay? And this is for the young men who are listening and watching this right now, um, and the young women too, but definitely the young men. The skills you have to develop and the way you have to grow to learn how to approach mm -hmm. a woman or a girl to talk to her, to get her to consider talking to you because you have to learn how to behave and not act like a goon or a, a moron or whatever. Uh, you know, how to present yourself, how to uh, accept it's, rejection. It's not like, even just it's not even just that, Sal. It's crazy how much that skill carries in. So check that's this what out. I mean. So it's I could like, I could think of a time. Okay, I'm in uh See here, water park. I'm I'm in fourth grade or fifth grade. I because I can recall of like the the nerves of talking to a girl. Yeah. Or go, whatever. And I remember there's this girl I liked, and I remember the, the pressure of the kids, like, oh, go talk to her, mm -hmm. go kiss her, go <laughs> right. And oh, scared to death yeah. and not wanting to do it, then doing it. And, and that whole thing, right? The, all the nerves that were flying in flying in me and stuff like that, the way I felt, and then the the feeling of overcoming that, yeah. and, and then that happening again and it being just a little less, a little less, and then you, you start to build that confidence. And then I think about these crazy, these crazy conversations and and meetings and negotiations that I have to have. Like mm -hmm. those same butterfly feelings before I get into those apply. they're still there I'm just so used to it because I've 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 been through that yeah. a thousand times 100%. in my life that I walk into doing no I'm not worried about this because I've, I've practiced this so many times yes. you, and that has nothing to do right me negotiating a contract for the, the business has nothing to do with kissing a girl in fourth grade but the fact that I had to practice that skill in real life yes. and overcome that and then the first time was really hard and then the next time was still and, hard but not as hard yeah, and if you get rejected okay you deal with it right i do this like again. it's not the end of the world like, that's right it's and you realize that after enough times of failing or getting denied and overcoming that feeling that now when i walk into these super high pressure situations that feeling is still there I, that it but it's take familiar me, but it's so it. familiar yeah. and i've and i've already seen what the worst outcome looks like of embarrassment or being told no or whatever that it's like so what mm -hmm. so what and and i'll never know unless i take this risk that's a skill and you, say it or do it and that's a skill you have to develop yes you don't just gonna naturally no i didn't have it naturally i wasn't like no. the fourth grade kid you know who, what, i wasn't scared i was like yeah i'm gonna go do this i was, yeah. like, no, I was terrified you know what yeah. i you know what i thought when i saw this here's the here's the silver lining um so uh when, if you're a guy today, young guy today, if you want to outcompete other guys, 
It's actually way easier than you think. You just got to be the guy to be walk normal. up to a girl. Yeah. <laughs> Confident and say hello. Because you're going to blow her nice mind. Way. Because yeah. girls like that. Women like that. They like somebody who's got, yeah. wow, he came up to me and talked to me. Like, yeah, take the initiative. And he said something to me and like, wow. And like, this is weird. Like he's not just hiding behind his phone. I mean, or, humans like that. We're social well, creatures. Well, yeah, so but, so, both sexes but like yeah, but this, that, is right? a, this is a fact though. Women are the gatekeepers. Okay. When it comes to this kind of stuff. And for well, who's there, been who, who made our social networks? Yeah, socially awkward nerds. <laughs> <laughs> That's where hey, the fuck we're going wrong, dude. Zuckerberg created Facebook so we could talk some, to chicks. Yeah, yeah. Dude, some jock has to create one, and you know. <laughs> That's actually like a good representation of uh, social interaction. Uh, yeah, dude. I know. I'm but, on it, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Justin's going to sell napkins. Yeah. yeah you write uh, your phone number. Your phone number yeah, exactly. you know I mean, it's, it's got to come Go back. Go do something. I, I think that we just, we live in a moment in time right now. I really do. I think that like, that's, this is how we learn as humans. Like we mm -hmm. have to go, we have to go one way to the other so far before we realize all the side effects and we need enough people to either die regret it get hurt bad things happen for us to realize oh maybe it yeah. wasn't as good of idea as we thought it was uh -huh. now let's correct a little bit let's figure it out so uh, what i what what is hard to measure and see is are we it has the pendulum swung all the way over like, like are we, it, nobody still have time to, yeah, yeah is it is it is it on its way back the other way or is it still going to get worse before it gets better I, I i think it gets like this conversation just five years ago okay mm -hmm. Or whatever it was when when you guys used to make fun of me of talking about irresistible all the time, like take a year before that, like nobody was talking about yeah. that. It's it's a, it's a topic. It's everyone millennials where we started to see the, the Gen Z was the one where it was like they were starting to kind born of into do it. the opposite. Oh yeah, yeah. and right? also it's just it was they were born into it, and so then you know it's not as cool because it's not as yeah, novel. Maybe so the, they'll they'll yeah. look at it with a with a more yeah. And you talk about this like it's, sure. it's in our it's in, in it's in our DNA that when you hit a, as a teenager you're going to rebel against something. And that's if right. That, if that was the if norm, that's the norm exactly. The generation before they're going to rebel just to yeah, rebel. Yeah, like well look at Johnny over there. He doesn't he's not he doesn't have social media. Yeah, you know? be I remember when I first started seeing that the Gen Z coming up where it became. I mean, you. I've already seen the trend on social media. It's like it's less cool to post on Instagram all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. like there was. I remember watching, you know, nine years ago or whatever it was when we first turned those things on and seeing like everybody posting and Darren Tony yeah. to post all these times and it's like now oh, all of a sudden it's not cool anymore. Everett versus Ethan's like age groups, like it's it for them. It's cool to have a walkie talkie. You know, <laughs> they went back. Like everybody's <laughs> like, you know, like just glued to their phone and device. And everything. Wow. did you see our buddy uh, uh, Enrico was sharing that? Um, who does the videography oh. for uh, Jordan Syed? Did the videography yeah, yeah, yeah. for NCI? Buddy of ours, right? Uh, he's recently blown up. By the way, I don't know if you guys have paid attention to him. He's which is so great to see. I've seen him plugging away for like the last five Hard years. Work. Yeah, and he's just Good really work. taken off. He shared an article the other day about what the generation now is wanting, uh, and this is a lesson for us as we're in the media space, uh, less produced stuff. Yeah, The overly produced YouTube era is over. Mm -hmm. uh, and which uh, and part of that the testament to that is the, the kid who we brought up the other day. Sam Solik. Sam Solik, yeah. which is this raw, gritty iPhone, no edits, me talking that that has become a trend now where people prefer that over the overly edited, hyped up, you mm. know, type of video. It's just the people are, people are just tired of getting lied to. It's like everywhere now. Yeah. That's you what watch, that part it's of that like, is. It's crazy. Did you guys see, I sent you guys that newscast. It was a full newscast and it was all AI. Every reporter was AI. You cannot tell. Oh yeah. Yeah. You cannot tell. Yeah, it's uh, a reporter talking so to trippy. the camera. The so entire true. thing was AI generated. It's wild. You used to be able to see like like six fingers, <laughs> yeah. or like you know, some kind of tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no tell now. So like, hey. yeah, yeah. Even so, their skin and everything. How you guys? No, I mean they looked really I mean, polished. But if you didn't tell when me, when you it was mention AI, it, yeah, you can kind of look back and see it. But you, which you could you probably easily fix by just making the the TV. The, oh, that's the, AI is going to get better. Yeah. It's going to be even harder to to no, no. Speaking of cool people, by the way, I got to say this. Uh, you know, we've been on this group thread and you've been talking a lot with Drew Canoli. He's the founder of <laughs> yeah, Organifi. Yeah, yeah. So I love Drew. Yeah. Drew Canoli founded Organifi. We've worked with them for, for a long time. One of our favorite supplement companies. And he's just, I love him because he's himself and he could, and if you tease him, he could take it and, dish and give it back. And he's just, he's just one of the guys. Yeah, I love dude. it. I love, he's I love people guy. like that. He's yeah. a very authentic authentically himself he i'm really excited i don't know if i shared this on the podcast um and i hope he doesn't mind me sharing i won't share complete all the details of like the the financials but 
you know, he, uh, I thought it was crazy that he had the wisdom and the uh, humility to step away from his company and allow somebody else to run it, right? He scaled it up. Yeah. It did incredibly well, made tons and tons of money, huge growth on projection to keep on a rocket ship and realize, that, hey, man, this thing's grown so big. It's got tons of employees. I'm going to step back, put a, a, a CEO in place and let him run it. And he's really kind of been behind the scenes for, I don't know how many years now, and is allowed to do that. But, you know, what happens sometimes in a situation like that is, you know, nobody is going to love your child as much as you love your child. Is he stepping back in? in that yeah. Position? yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you know, he's just, he's allowed it to run for a while and realized, man, there's a lot of things that um, he would have done differently. And he's like, he's now reinserted himself as the CEO again. And so it's kind of cool. It's cool to watch we, that we've been there before and after, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We were there when he was originally CEO. Then we were there when he, he stepped, see a little bit of the stepped away. Yeah. There, and then, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool to have this partnership with them and just to watch the different moves and stuff like that. You got to have him on the show again. Yeah. I, I texted him today actually about that, about getting him in in Q1. Yeah. So hopefully get him in Q1. This would be a great conversation. I'd love to hear it him share his story of the the growth the stepping away the what that was like and then coming back and he's also a new father yeah, too yeah, so yeah, yeah no it'll be a great conversation yeah i'll bring him back i gotta tell you guys something i just introduced my my three-year-old to so um i'm looking back to when i was a kid and the things that i liked and my three-year-old is so he's so similar in the sense that he likes the same kind of entertainment type of things that I like. So Tom and Jerry, I told you that we watched that. Yeah, I know it's not appropriate, whatever, but we have a good time. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's so great. Well, so the other violent. day, the other day, um, you know, Jessica was going to leave. He didn't want her to leave. So I'm trying to entice him to stay with me or whatever. She was going to take off for like an hour or two. And so I brought up, I thought, oh, you know what? He likes dinosaurs. You know what I used to watch a lot when I was a kid? Old Godzilla. Did you guys watch Godzilla when you were kids? Yeah, dude. All the old Everett ones? is insanely into it, bro. You really? All monster movies. Okay. Yeah. So I, I said, have I ever told you the story of Godzilla? And he's like, what's that? And so I told him the whole story and how he you know, rampages and he fights the other monsters. <sighs> and he's like into it. Yeah. He's like super into it. He wants to know Mothra. He wants to know like all the different, you know, Mecha Godzilla. Yeah. So I showed him some clips and he's like, so like into it. And he's like, why is this fire blue? I'm like, it's atomic breath. What? <laughs> yeah. This whole, so I'm like so excited because I get to go rewatch oh, yeah. all these old campy 1960s. Yeah. Japanese work monster your way up. I mean, it's coming back in the yeah. forefront, yeah. like the Kong, Kong versus Godzilla. We went through all that kind Do of Do you know that? So Monarch's one of, a new show on uh, Apple. One but, of the more popular, one of the most popular. So Godzilla went through phases, right? There's the campy era, right? The 1960s or whatever, when there you were know, people in suits and. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah smashes yeah. like yeah. all these models. So they, uh, the American monster was King Kong. J uh, Japan had Godzilla, which actually was called Gojira. But Americans pronounce it Godzilla. So you had Godzilla in so Japan. Is it really Gojira? Like, Gojira yeah. is the original. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. So Godzilla, Japan, King Kong, America. They made a movie that was yeah. King Kong versus Godzilla yes. with two endings. Yep. The American ending shows God shows King Kong winning. Yep. The Japanese ending shows Godzilla winning. A lot of people don't know that. What time did they yeah, do that yeah. in? Was it 19? Were... It was late 60s. Was around any wars? <sighs> no, but I mean, this is post World War II. Yeah, so, post. yeah. By the way, Godzilla was a product of fear around uh, Nuclear, atomic bomb testing. Yeah. So apparently, the way that he the story is that Godzilla was a, a you know that the atomic testing, the radioactivity caused the mutant. I didn't monster. follow any of that stuff. Uh, you never watched that? No. <gasps> and now he just draws energy off all these nuclear plants. Yeah, yeah so dude, he comes so cool. out of nowhere. He's yeah, so cool. I, I never. I, oh, it's the best. I I'll, tried to watch the newer one where they they the the newer one that they did not that long ago. Yeah. And I couldn't get into it. But now well, he's always the hero. He's always fighting off other like monsters. Well, that's how it turned out because the original one he smashes cities. Ah, everybody right now is killing. And then it was like he's a good guy. He's like fights other monsters. Yeah. And then they'd introduce all these other weird monsters. <laughs> There's one that has like a saw that runs through the side of his body. <laughs> he like runs into dude. Oh, it's so great, uh, dude. Dude, yeah. speaking of old things, I've got like uh there's this weird random fact. So you guys know the song, obviously, The Muffin Man. Yeah. And, and you know yeah. where all that comes from, like the origin of Muffin no, Man. No, I don't. It's actually Do you know like, again, a lot like uh, the Brothers Grimm, you know, and all the fairy tales. Oh, so it's got like a really twisted. A really dark oh. you know, like, place is where it came from. It, okay. was, it was really to like, Great. you know, scare kids, obviously, from uh, hanging around anybody that was kind of like this person. So there was a guy that turns out he was a serial killer and he baked 
muffins and, and bread and would go down through the streets and then lure kids into the alleys and, and basically kidnap them or like other people and then murder them. And then no uh, way. Yeah. And that became the kid yeah, became love, a song. I love stories like to that. kind of warn, to warn kids, kids. And then it, it, it just kind of shifted over the years into like this campy, you know, sort of version of it. Man, life was hard back then. The they had so they many. would sing I, you know, songs. I love, sing. So I love hearing or learning stuff like that because I think it's so fascinating how, like, for you know, decades probably we were singing. Everyone was singing that. Like, it's this cute little song. And it's like, no, you know that why we first taught our children that. Well, I'm just <laughs> saying, life was so hard that they created song like like Ring Around the Roses about the bubonic plague, exactly. people dying. Yeah. If we all fall down. That means literally everybody's dead. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Say, hey, this is life, kids. Let's sing about it. Yeah. I don't think it's like that. I don't think of it like that. I think of it like kind of like the same thing that Mr. Rogers did, right? I think it's like when you have really young children, you're trying to find a way to communicate to yeah. them that they can't, like you that can't. That is a very intelligent way. That's exactly, I think yeah, you're right, think 100%. It's, yeah, like yeah. it's, it's more, I think it was more like that yeah, than, you're it, right. than it was Get like. Getting to understand it. Without. Yeah, yeah. Like that was one of the things, the, I mean, <laughs> one of the most brilliant things about Mr. Rogers was that, you know, if you ever go back now and you or watch this documentary, you can see like, man, he was, was when we were going through all these complex, crazy things, you know, presidents getting killed and war and stuff like that. And he's like, he's basically role playing with dolls about it, but it's did, more to kind of make the kids feel. Did you, speaking it. of traumatic stuff, did you know that? The, so AI, they're using AI to scour news articles and studies and stuff. And these AI algorithms uh, have come up with this theory that there was a collective amnesia during the COVID time in the Western world. And the theory, meaning people have less recollection and memories of specific things and dates and stuff during that period of time than they normally would. They call it collective amnesia. And they're think, they think it's due to the trauma uh, that that whole period had. With the constant anxiety and fear, mm. the brain literally will prime itself to forget. So it's like, like interesting. And, and I've experienced this where I'll tell people yeah, like important to remind people. Yeah. Like you, you know <laughs> that they did this. They told people this to do happen. this. Like they said this and they said that like, no, they didn't. Yes, they did. You show them the news yeah. article, you know, and it's like, oh my God, collective amnesia. Look it up. It's pretty wild. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. And yeah. all the constant gaslighting. It's like, yeah, oh, it was wild. Of course. Yeah, yeah. All right. So our shout out today, uh, Gabriel Lyon, uh, and not just specifically her. We've talked about her and had her on the show. We absolutely love her, but she's actually hosting her first live event is it called forever strong does she name it the same thing of her or? yeah forever strong summit so it's january 14th in austin texas i know she's selling tickets already she got a, a, a huge lineup of all kinds of people some of our friends that we know there i know danica patrick's there don saladino absolutely love don bedros cody sanchez you guys heard me shout her out not that long ago that's a, a the business chick that i think is phenomenal they're really close friends and a whole host of other people that are on there but uh, want to shout her out. One of the, I mean, she puts out such great information. Amazing, great content. community. Austin is an awesome place, and so if you have the opportunity to make it to that summit to meet her and to listen to it, I think it'll be worthwhile. So check it out. What's the uh, website to find it at, Doug? Yes, Doctor Gabrielle Lyon, Lyon spelled with a Y. dot com. Excellent. Look, in today's episode, you'll hear, you'll hear us talking about bone broth protein, which is rich in collagen. Our favorite company for this is Paleo Valley. They have a chocolate bone broth protein. I'm not making this up. Tastes like chocolate donuts. It's incredible. No artificial sweeteners. Uh, bone broth protein, which is rich in collagen, is very easy to digest. So if you find protein powders cause bloating or digestive issues, probably not the case with Paleo Valley's bone broth protein. It's the one that I use the most because I am quite sensitive to certain foods and protein sources. Anyway, go check them out. Get yourself a discount. Go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump. If it's your first order, you get 15% off. All right, back to the show. First question is from Virginia Bennett. Why is lifting making me less flexible, specifically reaching to my toes? Okay, so- That's a myth. Yes, so I want to be clear. Um, strength training properly improves- what's called functional flexibility, meaning when you train through full ranges of motion, you develop strength through that whole full, through that whole range of motion. And flexibility without strength means you're unstable, can cause lots of injuries. So strength training increases functional flexibility. All right, now that I've covered that, someone may say, well, when I lift weights a lot, I just feel tighter. Well, there's two things that are happening. One, as muscles recover and repair in between sessions, you may feel tighter. Two, if you don't train with a broad range of yes. movements and different planes full of movement of and full ranges of motion, 
your body will get stronger in a particular way. And every other way that you can move, the, the contrast between the way that you strengthen and the other ways that you can move that you don't strengthen becomes so great that your body starts to limit your movement to keep things safe. So it's like a drag car that has tremendous horsepower going in a straight line. Well, you would not put that on a track with turns because it doesn't have the stability to turn properly. It would flip, right? So if you get really strong and all you ever do is like, you know, the same kind of movements and you never rotate or train laterally or do other full ranges of motion, little by little, the contrast will get so big that your body will, will try to limit you. So you'll move within a particular range of motion. When you go outside of it, your body tries to keep you in the other range of motion for fear of injury. And that, that can make you tight. Yeah. I think the most, the most common is one of the, one of the thing, two things that you said, which is people that are starting to, to weight train, they get really sore in a muscle and then they go the next workout and they go to stretch that muscle. And it's like, it feels really hard to stretch or yeah. hurts to stretch that muscle. It's because it's sore. It's not because you've lost that range of motion uh, by any means. It's just that you are, are sore and you're recovering. And that muscle in a stretched position when it's sore really hurts in that. If you were to actually not work out for the next two weeks and then go to stretch that, you'd find that you could move probably right. just as far or further than what you did before you actually trained that week. And so that's really it. Unless you're doing stuff in very shortened range of motions, right? So yeah. let's take like the hamstrings. If all you If you do these real short hamstring curls and you do these like you know a stiff legged deadlifts and you only go down so far and you get and you get stronger and stronger and stronger in this shortened range of motion uh and then you and you never practice going all the way down to your toes then yeah i mean it, your body will just it's a bit of a you. feedback loop of that right like yeah. in terms of like if maybe you had like some bit of uh, uh tightness and soreness uh that restricted a bit of your movement and then you know, you just, you, your natural tendency was to not, you know, get any more depth or to challenge it anymore. And so maybe, you know, you start approaching the exercise a little bit differently with different angles. You keep building on that, keep strengthening and, and repeating that sort of uh, movement pattern. Uh, and that becomes your default. Then yes, you are starting to lose range of motion with that, but that's something intentionally, if you, if you, especially when you're working out to, to, to be able to go through those full ranges of that's motion. one of the reasons why I address workout, that. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why workout programming, good programming is That's important. why it matters. This, I, is, this is also can be a sign of overtraining because so oh many, God, if yes. you're, I mean, I remember feeling this when I was bodybuilding because I was training at such high volume, high intensity all the time. I felt like this. I felt like, oh, but that's not because I was technically losing the range of motion. Just I was so sore. I was yeah. overtraining that everything in the stretch position hurt all the time. And so it wasn't that I'm losing that range of motion as much as it was a sign that like I was over training and overdoing it. And what I really needed to do was scale back on the intense weight training and probably Im implement more mobility drills. And what's crazy about that was that would facilitate more recovery. I would get stronger, build more muscle by actually starting to do that. So this could also be you, you could be overreaching and overtraining a bit and not addressing mobility. Yeah. You could potentially pull back on the amount of sets or potential intensity that you're training and put in some mobility drills specifically for where you feel like you're losing range of motion mm -hmm. and address that and watch what happens. Yeah, look, like proper strength training, good programming, j overall will improve your functional flexibility, which is the kind of flexibility that matters. But here's a good example. I've used this before, but I'm going to go a little deeper into it. So I have like a, I have a one-year-old daughter. Now I can bend her in all kinds of different positions. I mean, babies are like this. They're just hyper mobile, hyper flexible. Now, if I were to snap my fingers and make my one-year-old, excuse my one-year-old twice as strong, she would feel tighter to me when I move her around. Now, that's because her muscles are stronger and more able to protect and stabilize. When your muscles are weak, sometimes what happens is they don't, they can't stabilize very well. So you get hypermobile. Um, and this is why, like hypermobility, one of the cures for hypermobility in adults is to do strength training in shorter ranges of motion so they can create some stability. So there's a lot of factors that are in play here, but if you do strength training properly, it is a it is productive for functional flexibility, hands down. In fact, it's the most effective way to gain functional flexibility. If you do it wrong, then you can start to notice some issues, and then that's when injury becomes a problem. Next question is from Fulvio Castle. Is the biological value of protein important in a dieting context? It's important if you're not eating the upper limit of what would be considered optimal protein intake. Okay, so biological value essentially refers to the, the quality, I'll just say, of a protein. So a protein with a high BV 
uh, gram per gram in comparison with one with a lower BV will be more effective at building muscle, improving satiety, recovery, uh, up until you get to the point where that person is consuming so much protein, it doesn't matter. In other words, if you're a 150 pound person and you're eating 150 grams of protein, this doesn't matter that much. If you're a 150 gram per, uh, pound person and you eat 100 grams of protein, now it matters. So it depends where your intake is. If you're not hitting those upper limits, then yeah, you want to go with like whey protein, egg protein, meat. If your protein intake is low, if your protein intake is really, really high, well, yeah, now it doesn't, doesn't make sense. I'm trying to come difference. up with a good analogy. I've been asked this question a few times hmm. and questions like this, where we're, we're talking about types of proteins and stuff like that. And we've discussed before in the podcast where it doesn't matter. And I'm trying to draw a good analogy for people to understand that, that it, they get that, like, when, once you get to a certain amount of this thing, it really doesn't matter anymore. As long as you hit that, that target becomes the most important thing. Well, have okay, you, I'll, I'll come, give you an analogy. You came out with a good analogy. I'll give you an analogy. Something Let's, else in life like that where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, everybody makes a big deal about the kind of this, but then as long as you have this much of it, that stuff doesn't matter so much anymore. Yeah, um, I'm not, I mean, this isn't a real life example, but to give, just to create uh, something that might displace a little better. Imagine if I had two jars full of red and green marbles and one jar was mostly red and the other one was 50-50. And my goal was to get mostly as many red marbles as possible. Well, after a certain point, it doesn't matter which jar I scoop from because I'm just going to, I'm going to have so many marbles, I'm going to have enough red. But if I only do one scoop, which one am I going to go with? The one that's got more red marbles. So high quality proteins uh, have higher amounts of essential amino acids, which include the branch chain amino acids. And they're also uh, easily absorbable and utilizable by the body. So if your protein intake is not, now this is why it matters to most people. Most people don't hit those protein targets. Most people don't eat their target body weight in grams of protein. So for most people, I would say, yeah, I think you should pay attention to the quality of your protein. This is why you take somebody and they add a scoop of protein and it doesn't get to the top level, but they'll notice a difference between whey and a difference between soy. Like whey makes way so that's more a, that's another way. That's another way to say it, right? Is that like I, I, there's value in paying attention to this. But there's not value in getting hung up on this. Like I wouldn't not eat something because it, its biological value is lower yeah. than to say this other thing that I that I can't even have access to right now. Correct. It's like I'm better off just eating that protein because yeah. I need the protein just because it has a lower uh, you know, biological value than this other protein unless I have a choice of the two of them. And now if I have a choice of something that's got a higher bi biological value and they're, and then something that's lower and they're both at my disposal, well then yeah, absolutely choose the better one. No yeah. matter what the case is, you probably yeah. should always choose that. Well, I mean, you, I would think one that you could digest most easily would, would you know play a factor, that's a huge factor right that's more, more than like uh in terms of quality because once you get to that point right you're you're you need to check that box and that's fill me that. yeah. that's me like whey protein outranks collagen protein by far in in biological value but you um, digest collagen but right? i can't have whey protein or bone broth right whey in protein messes me up so yeah. i'll have collagen or bone broth protein and i'll just have a lot more of it yeah. Like 80 grams of bone broth protein. You can't digest. Right. 40 grams of whey protein versus 40 grams of bone broth protein. 40 grams of whey is going to win. 80 grams of collagen, you know, or bone broth protein. Well, now I've had so much of that protein. That's such a better, I think that's such a better thing for the average person who's trying to figure yeah. this out instead of getting over, like, you know, no, better than anybody, you know, like when you eat, uh, you know, this meat versus that meat, which one you digest better or totally that protein that. powder versus that protein yep. powder, forget the biological value on it. 100%. Which one it's easier, which, makes me feel better. Like, all yeah. And that's such a way easy, more important, way, way more important, way easier for the average person to measure too, than to get caught up in the nuances of what one is technically better like that because it's a, i made that choice last night so it's a, you know interesting you brought that up it's like you know i've i've noticed that and i've obviously obviously we went through the whole dairy thing with uh cabral and so even though whey is supposed to be okay for me it still doesn't sit as well as like the paleo valley bone broth protein yeah. so and i had both at my disposal last night and i'm like you know what like yeah i like the taste of the way one yeah it's it but it's you know what this one sits well, so much can easier i say on me. something just a little off off shoot here because you're doing so much stuff for your skin and all of it is geared towards producing more collagen and healing of the skin you should be supplementing if you do take a protein with a bone broth which is high in collagen because the amino acids in that are 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 directly uh more connected to healing of the skin connective tissue and stuff like that so Next question is from Honey Beast. Is it normal to get cold faster after you lose weight? Here's what's interesting about this. Yeah. Or body fat. So here's what's interesting You're less about insulated. this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so I've I've actually years ago 
I Perfect had house analogy. I, re- Here it I, comes. I remember that. I remember that when I was shredded, dude, that was cold all the time. Well, so I'm going to tell you something's going to blow your mind. What? So I had uh, a client that was a very, very smart doctor. And I made a comment about, you know, like body fat being insulating or something like that. And he goes, actually, it's not as insulating as you think. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, yeah, if you have a ton of body fat, then it's more insulating. He goes, but, uh, you know, 30 pound difference. He goes, it's, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Is it how it's dispersed? With body, no. He oh. goes, it doesn't make a bit the big of a difference body temperature. And I said, that's bullshit. I said, when I'm dieting or getting leaner, I'm cold. And he goes, that's your metabolism slowing down. And it was like, Poof. so yeah. what happens when people, the reason why people's body temperature drops when they're leaner is they're eating in a calorie deficit. Mm. One of the ways your body adapts is by, Producing less heat. Ah, so it doesn't yeah. have to heat up as much. That's right. So it's slowing down. And do you remember post post bodybuilding show when you were shredded, but then you started eating a lot? I yeah. bet you felt warm and hot. Hmm. Your metabolism kicked back up. Interesting. So it's not about the fat. It's less about the actual fat. It's more about the metabolically. What's hundred percent? I mean, you, you get enough muscles. Way more insulating than fat, by the way. Yeah. In terms of uh, you know protecting you uh, in, in making you warm, body fat's actually not that insulating. You have to have a lot of it. In order to produce like enough of an effect. I always feel yeah. that at night. Like if, you know, if, if it's in a phase where I've been working out a lot, I got more muscle, I'm like way hotter. Yeah. yeah. Always. Next question is from Cole Lifts Sometimes. Would you guys recommend opening your own gym, stu- uh, studio gym or working for a big box? Right. Definitely not. Opening so the, the question is, would you rather open your own studio gym over working for a big box. I work for a big box. Yeah, for, for sure. Big box. <sighs> you know who I recommend should huh? own a studio? Nobody. <laughs> well, there is, it's people, rare. People that, people that don't want to make money? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, who, else? Look, who else would you Massive recommend? Overhead. Look, <laughs> every person in this room would probably, if given the choice and you had to do it for the rest of your life, would want to own your own studio because entrepreneur-minded people don't want to work for other people. So, and now that's a trade. Because it's going to be way harder to make money. Sure, it's there's got a lot more work. Entrepreneurs work first to like uh, reverse engineer the systems to bring that over into your box. So I don't know. Again, I still think it's it's massively important to work in uh, hundred percent. It's such it's such a it's a it's such a hard it's a very difficult business model to make. Super difficult and and. And it's really difficult to make a lot of money doing it. It just really is. It's already, it's difficult because the hours, it's difficult because there's not as much demand for that as there is for ice cream or something crazy. Like it's not, you're better off being a franchise owner of 31 flavors than you are opening up (laughs) a a small gym of your own. It's just, just not a lot of money in that. It's just really, really difficult to do that. And so, but if, if all if you don't care about that and it's and you're like ah either one you've already that's my passion yeah you've already made a bunch of money i mean i put it in the same category one day i'm going to own a bar or a cigar lounge one day i will i think those are so cool not because i think i'm going to make money doing it seriously because i want a cool lounge that i can go hang out at or meet my buddies at the bar and have a beer what's the or watch fail sports. rate with bars it's got to be through the roof Huge. i know I'm, restaurants are super high i'm sure it's high yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and 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 hard to be really profitable and yeah. gyms are very similar in that in that fashion and for some reason trainers don't realize that they and what and here's what they what they do is they work for a gym and this is this they all do the same math they go 40% of the session yeah, goes going, to the gym. You know, I'm having to either rent this space or I'm having I'm having to pay all this money to this to this gym owner, this space money, or I, I have to 24 hour fitness or lifetime, whatever company you work for, takes half of what these clients are paying. All these people, they love me. They're not even here for them. They're here because of me. And they would follow me anywhere I go. And so they just do the math of if I just took all my people who've already told me they would follow me anywhere, mm-hmm. that, that that I would make X amount more. What they don't factor in is how they got that lead and what it cost to get that lead. They just assume that it was like that simple that, oh, yep. you just get like to get 20 clients that tell you, I would train with you, Justin, for the rest of your life cost so much money in advertising and marketing to do that. You have no idea. Plus there's a yeah. turnover, you know? Well, that's, and that's yeah. my point is that, so yeah, maybe initially when you go start the gym, mm-hmm. you have, and you are 20 people who leave that lifetime gym. So here's what, now here's what I tell all of my trainers that wanted to do this. Cause of course I encourage some people to do it. I have people like Justin who left and did this. So first step one, work in a big box. You have to be number one. If you cannot be the top trainer in your local little, you know, gym, big box gym, you're guaranteed to fail. You are, on your you are gonna have <laughs> yeah. way harder of a time run, yeah. running your own facility. And then the other thing I was gonna tell that 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 person is a good goal 
is can you go generate leads outside of the ones that you got from mm -hmm. the big gym that you're working for? So I there was a time that I was moonlighting, right? I would have got fired for doing this. But 24-Hour Fitness cut all the GM or all the FMs and GMs. Uh, they, they put a cap on us as far as like how much money we can make. We used to back in the old days. The more I hit goal, the more revenue I generated the club, a I made a percentage yeah. of that. So I had full control of my paycheck, yeah, right? Yeah. It, was a, it was a good time to, to be in the business. And eventually they put this cap. Didn't matter how much I sold, I was, I was capped out. So at that point, I had already been used to a lifestyle of making a certain amount of money. And it was now going to be impossible for me to make the same income that I had been making for years. So I said, fuck it, I'm going to moonlight. I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to go and I'm going to start a boot camp hustle on the side. But one of the things that I made a promise to myself was what I don't want to do is I'm not going to use the company to generate leads for my boot camp. So if I if if I'm going to go moonlight and I'm going to do that, my my defense when the time comes when I get caught possibly is I'm going to show them that none of these people are 24 hour fitness members. Mm -hmm. And I and so the goal was can I go build that independently mm -hmm. from the gym? And I did. And so that was a, a sign to me. And it also protected me from ever getting fired because eventually that stuff came out. And then when I could show them that none of these people were from 24-Hour Fitness, they don't have much of a leg to stand on. But if they all had 24-Hour Fitness memberships Especially and they, they, were, work out of your and they were all clients yeah. and they were all clients paying at 24-Hour Fitness, all I really did was poach their leads. Yeah. Yeah. And that looks really bad. And, that, and so you need to go prove to yourself you could be the top guy or girl in your gym. And then you need to be able to prove to yourself you can generate enough leads to legitimately build a business outside of that facility. Listen, then you're ready to do listen, your own business. Here's how. Here's the difference, okay, with big box. Any one of us could go into a big box gym right now, prime time, and within a couple hours probably get six clients. Probably get six clients to buy packages from us. Why? Because they're sitting there. They're in the gym working out. Mm -hmm. You own your own studio. Like, okay, where are these people? <laughs> <laughs> They're not in there working out on their own. There's not tons of money in advertising going to it. So it's exponentially more challenging. Now, the only time this works is if what I'm about to say resonates with you. Okay. This is a saying that's about entrepreneurs, but when you hear this, if this makes you laugh and kind of like, yeah, that's me. Well then, okay, maybe you'll consider this, but still got to pass the litmus test that Adam said that an entrepreneur is somebody who's willing to work 80 hours a week to avoid working 40 hours a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now real entrepreneurs laugh at that because that's what it's like. It's like, yeah. wow, I went to go start my own thing. I'm working twice as much, yeah. making half as much, but I'm unemployable because well, nobody can tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. I just can't like, I, I consider myself unemployable. Like yeah. working for someone for me would be so torturous that I would much rather make less money. Now, if there, of course, if I was in a pinch and I had to, I would do it. No problem. But that that's the kind of person it, I'd say you it know, requires different skill sets. It's it's you know, yeah. You could be a, the best trainer in, in your area and but not be a great business operator or know how to scale a company very well. I mean, our 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 uh our barber, Vicky, breaks my heart to watch this. She's got she she runs two facilities and this girl I can't remember the last time I met somebody who grinds like this. Oh, she, yeah. I mean she's she, a machine. She is a killer. Hard working and and I remember, I, and I'm, I'm always hearing the stories of all the fires she's putting out, and all the people she's managing, and all the all the stuff, the city stuff she's dealing with. And I'm like, Vic, if you, if all you did was just cut hair and had a chair, and, set, and, and had a chair yeah. at somebody else's facility, and, and came to ours like you do, like, would would you not make more money? She's like, Oh my god, I would make so much more money. And it's like, it's so wild, right? Yeah. But she's unemployable, like like we like. I mean, like yeah, I get yeah. it, dude. I but get I, it, dude. Can but you imagine I, her working for someone. Uh, no, no. But I mean, no, you got to be, be okay with that, right? Yep. So, you're like, and, and and if that, if you can hear that story, and you're like, yeah, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with potentially making way less money and working way harder, and because you love doing that, or you love being a business operator, then okay, then then so be it. Or if you have a chip so hard that you're like, I'm going to prove him wrong, then go get it. Well, but it's like, I think a lot of people step into that the, world not realizing how difficult. Listen, it really here's is. the deal: their fitness is a if you get into it as a career and you're going to, and you got some staying power, it's because you have a deep passion for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it is a hard business. So if, and, and this goes right into what I'll be doing in January, uh, mindpumptrainer.com. If you go there, I'm doing a three day free live seminar for coaches and trainers. And the, part of what I'm going to be covering is this, is how do I take my passion and turn it into a career that will sustain me and my family? Not just how do I do this passion and then struggle and then have to go do some other job because I can't make any money. That's part of what I'm going to be covering. That's at mindpumptrainer.com. If you're a coach or trainer, 
sign up. It's it's totally free. Um, look, you can also find us on Instagram if you want more information. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump to Stefano and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 